right, welcome everybody to another episode of Face the Truth. Uh, I'm excited to talk uh, to this guy uh, that I have a, as a guest this week. Um, and first of all, I I just want to talk about something real quick. I had a great. I'm, I'm super tired. I was up really late last night. I don't know what's going on, but um, I have. I don't even know why I feel like sharing this, but I think this is going to be kind of a fun little thing. It's just on my mind, so I'm going to I'm going to talk about it. It's my podcast. I can say whatever I want. Uh, last night. I had a really nice time finally by myself in like a peaceful, awesome, just secluded feeling where I'm in the middle of the city all the time and it's just crazy. There's all these nutty things going on in the world. And I go out my front porch and I, and I decide I want to smoke a cigar that a friend gave me. And so I'm sitting on the porch. It's like midnight. There's not a car driving down the city. It, it's just quiet. There's no sound. And as I'm sitting there smoking my cigar, all the animals start coming out in the city. It's really weird because you're not. I, I was blown away. I was shocked by this. I'm sitting there, and it's. Just, and by the way, I don't smoke weed. This was a cigar, okay? So I wasn't tripping. And all of a sudden, all these little bunnies, like 20 to 30 bunnies, hopping around the city, just like literally, they, they start playing in the streets. I'm like, this is crazy. What, what's going on? I saw a raccoon, and then. I see right in front of my porch, a skunk walks right right in front of me, and I almost freaked out. It turned, it turned its tail kind of went up a little bit, and I was like, oh, crap. Um, and it walked away. But it was, anyways, I thought of it because the artist I'm talking to does wildlife art, and I was just thinking how crazy coincidental is this that I had that create that experience. But it was nice. It was like this nice, peaceful experience uh, with animals in Chicago that I didn't really know come out to play at night, so I guess they do. Anyways... Enough of that. Um, this guy, I, 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 he wrote me a little bit ago, and um, I started talking to him online, saw his work. Blows me away. Uh, super, super hyper realistic type airbrush work, um, wildlife work. It's just amazing. Also, some beautiful charcoal drawings, and so I really want to get into it with him. Um, my dad uh, was a wildlife artist for, gosh, 30-something plus years. Um, so I, I know a little bit about that lifestyle and, and what goes into the art. So I'm curious to, to hear his perspective inside of things. So anyways, he's been patient listening to my stupid stories about animals. So without further ado, <laughs> oh, good. please welcome Mr. Dennis Mayer. Anyways, true story. It was like I felt like fucking Snow White last night. All the animals and walking around. It was crazy. Maybe they were attracted by the smoke or something. <laughs> the smell. It was weird, man. It was really, really. I don't know. It was fun. So, um, so yeah, man. Um, your work is awesome. It's Thank so you. cool. Um, and uh, it's really, it's one thing that I really appreciate right off the bat. I mean, I do traditional work, um, but I also do digital work, and I do a lot of. Um, I've, I've, I've done a lot of super hyper realistic type paintings, so I know what goes into it. But what blows, what blew me away was those tractor illustrations that you sent me all done with airbrush. I'm assuming like on an illustration board or something like that. Yeah. But it's insane. It's insane, man. Um, I've got tons of questions and stuff, but, um, how, where did you come from? Like, <laughs> Like this, I've I've never seen airbrush work like this before. It's pretty awesome, man. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, first, I just I just want to say this before I start my my portion, is <laughs> I, I got to know your work uh, when I heard uh, the podcast you had with uh, Drew Struzan. Oh, okay. And when Drew said that uh, your caricature was one of the best he's seen so far. I thought to myself, this guy must be good because Drew Struzan is, is the real deal as far as the artist goes. Yeah. So that's, that's how I got to see your work. And I've never been into caricature or cartoons, whatever. But when I saw your work, it's like, wow, it's literally, it's just like a full realistic painting with exaggerated proportion. That's all there is to it, really. But I mean, yeah. we underestimate sometimes the, uh, the caricature, you know what oh, I mean? Yeah. Like, um, no. We tend I to know. think, oh, it's just it's just loose and all this stuff. Yeah. But when I saw your work, and what is funny is is in my style, 
one little brush stroke away could actually uh, not look good. But right. you, you can go so far in exaggerating, and yet you put it beside the photograph of your reference, and you can tell it's still him. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I can appreciate it's an art by itself. You know, I'm not sure if I could exaggerate my animals that far. <laughs> and oh, still make could. them it's, look like a real a, exaggeration is a different uh, I, by the way thank you I appreciate that but exaggeration is a completely different muscle you know like first and foremost I am an artist like I can draw and paint whatever you know um, and I spent many years learning how to draw and paint people realistic uh, proportions and all that kind of stuff and but caricature is something I've been doing since I was a little kid and it's a different kind of muscle it's, it's you know you, once you start flexing that and practicing you'll start to see things in exaggerated form you know even animals cars it doesn't matter so it's it's a lot of fun it's interesting but um but as i mentioned before my dad um was a wildlife artist he won wildlife artist of the year in 84 i think uh he's done duck stamps he, he's won trout stamps um and so i grew up all around like wildlife art um, like little duck heads and things in my house and everything. And I used to sketch animals constantly. Um, and so my dad worked mostly in acrylic for most of the years. Now he's now he does uh, like plein air oil painting. That's mostly what he's into now. Um, but how did you get started in all of this stuff? I mean, your work is just phenomenal. It's it's um, it's very uh, there. There's sorry. I know I just asked you a question, but I just I was just thinking about like. You know, there's a difference. You know, I, I've seen lots of wildlife art, but there's a difference in what I'm seeing your work because one thing I notice is besides how detailed your work is, I see you put a lot of like character in there. Um, like I even noticed, like even in like the little blades of grass or different like things like leaves and different things, you're not just painting like basic, you know, just oop, little grass, but they all have some kind of character. Um, in a way. And so it was, it's really cool. The whole package is so tight and so awesome. Well, <clears throat> it's a long story, but I mean, uh, first of all, uh, I don't think they would allow that today, but I left school at 13 years old. Oh, okay. And I could not get along well with the school system. I, I, I think it was my artistic mind. And I think it's, 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 it's happening a lot with the artists. Um, anyways, I was just a kid and I was like, really a brat at school I, I just i just <laughs> couldn't understand any of this stuff and i remember a school uh, uh teacher when he would go away for a few days uh and we'd have uh what you call that a substitute teacher mm -hmm. and they would say uh if this guy dennis starts to be a brat give him a chalk and let him draw on the board and he'll be quiet that's his remedy <laughs> and uh let's <laughs> let's <laughs> literally that's that's what it was so at the time my dad was a sign painter by trade mm -hmm. uh, back then it was all done by hand and my dad his job back then would be like he was i don't know how to say it in english but it's like the the tracing department mm -hmm. so basically somebody would bring a business card let's say of your company logo and he would have to enlarge it proportionally by hand 50 feet, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 50 so feet you, long okay. on a paper and then they would perfor it and, you know, and all the powder and trace it up in this old school process, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, so at the time, my dad uh, was a sign painter and he was working at home. And that's when I left school. And the school uh, uh, principal said to my dad, he said, this kid is losing his time here. He knows already what he wants to do. He wants to be uh, an artist. So anyway, so I went to work with my dad, but me, I thought I would have like a year break type of thing, you know, like kind of chill out a little bit or something. Literally, I'm telling you, Jason, literally, I took my school bag. My dad said, you didn't want to go to school. I took my school bag, put it in the corner. I started right away to work with my dad, mm. like just flat out. And the worst is back then we didn't have those fancy enlargement, uh, what you call the digital art enlargement. And mm -hmm. well, you know, you know when you see though, because my dad, all his clientele was developers, construction, you know, for the the condos or houses or whatever. So he had a big client, and this client was into developing condos. So we had to draw by hand, paint by hand the whole condo that you see sometime on the development uh, site, right? Today. Oh yeah. 
it's just picture and it's enlarged and it's stick on the sign. But we had to do it all by hand. So there I am standing in the hallway of my house with a, a eight feet by eight feet. So it's two four by eight feet uh, plywood sheets on top of each other. And my dad went and grid it all up. Yeah. And I, and I was trying to. So imagine I'm standing there in front of this big eight feet by eight feet. And I had to enlarge this all by grid. Like I had some potential. But I mean, I was not there yet, you know, so I got really discouraged. So from then, my dad find out I couldn't trace it up and this and that. I was too, too much time consuming. So he went and he bought a, a school projector. So basically, we traced up this whole condo in a piece of an acetate with a little mm, yeah. fine marker, put Old that school. on the school <laughs> and then projected. So anyway, all that to say that I started out into a, a sign painting with my dad, uh, I'm originally from the uh, from Montreal, <clears throat> so my dad had the second uh, biggest sign shop in the city of uh, uh, Montreal on the South Shore, and we could put a 50 feet trailer in in our garage. It was a family business. So, anyways, we did that for about maybe a little bit over a year, and then uh, my dad was was getting tired. And anyway, it's a bit long story. But we quit the business of sign shop and uh, we went into architectural renderings like the one I've shown you. Well, that was a whole, my dad, I remember, he said, you want to draw, you want to really be an artist? Okay, we ain't going to do letters from A to Z no more. We're going to really draw. So we went into architectural renderings, but we, I had no clue what that was. Like, I mean, how to proceed, where to start. And anyways, uh, when I say I worked a lot, and I, I'm sure you went through the same path, I mean, talk about depriving myself from playing out with my, my friends and I was just locked mm -hmm. in my room <laughs> and, and just being obsessed by it. You know what I mean? And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, we I started in sign painting. I've never been a real sign painter. My dad was a real, I don't know if you know about the, what you call the script. Yeah, yeah. The script. Well, basically, it's all about the pressure of your brush. The more you press, the wider it is. And yeah. as you go, my dad would do I still, I probably won't even, can't even do that today with all my art experience. It's it's a whole different. Oh yeah, it's that's different. Funny. Yeah. And then my dad would go what he would call the the one stroke. Basically, he would take the brush, just the stroke of the brush would be the thickness of his lettering. So so if you apply too too heavy, then it gets wider. So it's literally the pressure has to be regulated all the way. And he would do, like he was really. Yeah painter so anyways so we started cool. i start i did about a year with my dad helping him and then we went into architectural renderings like you've seen there and then i went really good i i get to be really good and uh i got to be in 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 contact with a company in st louis missouri and uh i had a six years contract uh, uh with them and uh i don't want to brag myself but i had no competitors in that field yeah. The reason why it's because the inside of me, I've always been more a fine artist than a commercial artist. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you look at my architectural renderings, look at the landscaping is way beyond what a normal architectural uh, renderer would do. Yeah. Architect architectural illustrator is all based uh, on representing form, shape, color of the building and a little bit of trees to kind of give a bit of a mood. But me, I would go full fledged. Mm -hmm. So I would have more fun to do the landscaping than the house by itself, you know? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I was I was criticized at one point. I, I mean, you should see some of the renderings I did. It didn't make sense. I mean, they were like in in the, in the mountains in Switzerland. I mean, there was no end of it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it just, yeah. I just had fun <laughs> doing the landscaping, you know what I mean? But uh, anyway, so then after that, back to your question for that airbrush uh, of that tractor and so forth. Uh, I got myself a job uh, when I was 26 years old and uh, as an illustrator in-house. And that company was uh, a company who would do the digital uh, enlargement on uh, inkjet printers for restaurants and, and displays. It's a display company. It's, it's commercial uh, advertising agency, right? So anyway, I got to be an illustrator in-house for three years in there. And... Uh, and I had to prove myself that I could do beautiful work. Now you have to understand when I got there, I had no portfolio at all. So mm. I 
I, sh I got there wanting to be a commercial artist or illustrator or airbrush illustrator, but yet all I had to show them was my architectural renderings. Mm. So <laughs> they really had to trust me, but I really, I, I mean, talk about self-promoting. I really went heavy on bragging myself. I wanted the job so bad. Yeah. Then, then I started to do in between the jobs they would bring me, uh, I would do portfolio work. So I would do all kinds of things, you know, like you've seen the surgeons and the operation table to cars, to food, to just to kind of to build themselves a portfolio for them to have a tool to go out and actually contact other agencies to say, hey, we have an artist in house. That's his skill. Bang, boom. That's what he can do. Right. But uh, and that tractor there, this this was done there about when I was about 27 years old. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 and, and what got you started with the airbrush? Was it the actual the 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 architecture drawings? You were doing those in airbrush? I have to tell you a funny story. When we first started to work with air back then we had the yellow page, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> what's that? <laughs> yeah. So basically, uh when I was working with my dad, I started to do a little bit of commercial art to practice a little bit. So finally I said, why don't we go and contact another, uh, an illustrator and see if we can go and visit him. It was a different world back then, right? <laughs> About in 1990 to be exact. So I got all of that illustrator. I said, hey, my dad goes like, my son is a talented kid and would like to, to have a visit uh, and visit a real professional illustrator. Would you allow us to do that? He said, yeah, come on over, no problem. So we got there, and this guy was doing amazing, kind of bit of a loose. He was doing a lot of editorial uh, illustration, you know. Mm. And he was, he would go from the the most corny looking drawing, if that's what you need, to the most realistic. The guy was versatile. So, anyways, I was very impressed. It's like, wow, I mean, that that's crazy. So I went home and I started to to practice the airbrush, and I didn't even know how to wash this thing. What, what's what's happening, you know? And we had no YouTube's back then, yeah. nothing, right? <clears throat> mm -hmm. To make a long story short, is now I had a few original airbrush illustrations that I want to use to go out and uh, show my work to advertising agencies. <clears throat> we framed them up with a glass and this aluminum frame around, right? So now imagine we had about 10 original frame. Some of them were like two feet, three feet wide. Yeah. We were on the street of St. Catherine in Montreal, and it's a very slopey hill. This this big black briefcase for artists was loaded with those framed glass original. Oh it, no! It weighed a ton. Yeah. So when we'd call the advertising agencies or the graphic uh, uh, designer, we'd say, "Hey, we would like to show you so, your work." But you know what? We'd ask them. We say, uh, "Excuse me. Uh, we just want to make sure. Do you have enough room in your in your in your place?" The guy goes, "Like, what are you talking about? Because we need room." I mean, talk about we were naive. We had no clue of nothing. So we, we <laughs> would show up at the advertising agency's office and literally display all our frame original. So you would take a whole room. Later on, we discovered that we would have to actually take our original, have them photographed, put them on four by five transparency slide. <laughs> yeah. And what we would do That's... is we would, we would take a, a blackboard, make an opening, and put the four by five transparency behind it. So when we put that on the light box, it's a nice black frame and you just see the transparency popping out, right? So that eliminates all this crazy heavy stuff we had to carry. I mean, yeah. <laughs> talk about like, I mean, but anyway. Well, I mean, we have, there's, it's so funny. I, I, I relate to a lot of what you're talking about um, being that, like I, I remember when I first started in all this stuff, there was no, you know, there was no like networking online yet. There was no, you know, it was very difficult to get a hold of people and uh, to see. There was no YouTube, like you said. So you, you had to kind of figure things out. So I totally relate to a lot of trial and error trying to figure out. You know, I'm a self taught artist as well. So I remember I would just like look for artists that I really 
liked and just try to figure out – I didn't even know what mediums they were using, but I would just – use whatever mediums I had and try to mimic that look. And then years later I find out, oh, they were not even using anything like what I was trying to do. And But um, yeah, I, the airbrush thing is, is interesting for me just because um, I've, I've tried playing with airbrush a little bit just for fun. And um, uh, for one summer, like years ago, uh, this guy invited me uh, in Chicago to do live caricature work um, at, the, at Navy Pier. And um, and they do airbrush uh, painting, and so I, I I did that for a summer, and I really didn't like it. Like I didn't like all the stuff going up in my nose all the time, and like, um, I mean I was able to do some okay. I was doing like silly, quick drawings with it, so it wasn't like super super rendered. I did a few airbrush paintings where I really tried to take my time for like samples, you know, uh, and it was, you know, I could tell that if I played with it more. I could get the hang of it, um, but I never really got to the point of with airbrush getting super, super uh, tight. But I can see how because of the softness of it and the way that you can lay it, it allows for you to get some really, really nice soft edges and stuff, you know, rendering. Um, so is that one of the reasons why you ended up sticking uh, with that was um, like, like right now you blurred out your background. And I, I think it's kind of interesting because it almost feels like an airbrush painting behind you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, for for painting, like you, you've got a real um, attraction towards hyper realism. So I guess what I'm wondering is like, was the airbrush something that kind of attracted you to that? Uh, uh, that you thought you could you could do that with the airbrush, or because that just seems it seems crazy to me because airbrush seems a little cumbersome i guess is maybe what i'm thinking like you know what i mean yeah well the the thing with airbrush is there's a lot of cutting out there's a lot of masking there's a lot mm -hmm. of taping preparation for a little bit of you know yeah. a little spray and then you gotta undo it all but all the very sharp line that you saw like on my tractor it's it's uh it's done by using frisket Oh yeah, yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, it comes. It's like a Mac tack coming in, comes in a roll, right? Mm -hmm. So I would take a little swivel exacto, cut it all out, and sometimes we'll just take a paper and lift it up a little bit for different effect and stuff like that. But I think what inspired me to do realistic airbrush is I got in contact with the Japanese airbrush artists. Have you ever seen some of their work? Like the, the oh yeah, cutaway views of the motorcycles and and the oh car. yeah, it's yeah. it's crazy. I mean, like it talk about detail. So, uh, yeah, so I mean, it, it's, it's whatever I would do. I was always tempted to, you know, going toward realism. But for me, airbrush has always been a very stiff mechanical tool. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not where I belong at the time. I was happy with it, and the, but my, my dream was to do what I do now, fine art. Mm -hmm. I, I, and then I ended up doing architectural rendering before, I did millions of straight straight lines, working with a set square all day long. Very vanishing, fancy boxes. <laughs> vanishing points, all yeah. this stuff, you know? And then after that, uh, uh, then when Airbrush came along, uh, that's another thing. A lot of technical cutting out and little, you know. I just, I just want to have a brush and a canvas and, and just be relaxed. Don't have to go all this craft around just to do a little, you know. So yeah. what, what you see there is, is you may appreciate it, but I was not necessarily happy. Yeah, it was stressing out a little bit. Uh, no, but it's not where I belong as far as, as pursu oh, I see. pursuing my art, my talent. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's why I'm saying it's a bit of a, it was a bit of a journey. I went from architect uh, uh, sign painting, architectural rendering, commercial art which is airbrush and then now i'm into wildlife and lately i combined the western art as well and so for the wildlife art that you're doing now um you are you no longer doing airbrush with those or is that is that do you use airbrush for like a foundation and then come in if you look on my website i think the seven f first one on the top they're all in oil all the other ones, including the architectural renderings, uh, it's all done with gouache. Oh, okay, okay. I've wow, used, that's awesome. I've used gouache for thirty years. I, I, yeah. I could, I mastered the. the I yeah, gouache the is, is a really fun medium. 
That's gouache, awesome. gouache is a cr- I mean, you cannot. I think I heard someone on your podcast talking about the medium of the gouache a bit uh, before, and gouache is not forgiving like mm. the like the oil. I mean, if you make a mistake, you apply white on a certain color, it appears mm-hmm. a different. I mean, it's it's a whole science to ca- in oil. You wait till it dries. You have yellow right on top of a blue, and that's it. Boom, it's done. But in gouache, it's a different process. You know, it's it, and you cannot make too much mistake. So I was using uh, airbrush when I would do the uh, when I would use the uh, uh, gouache, but with oil, uh, I haven't used the airbrush for like maybe like. Wow, so Here. that's so that's pretty awesome. Okay, so um, I love oil painting, and and uh, I used to do a lot of acrylic work. Um, that's kind of the I, I kind of started with watercolor, and uh, and once I gained enough courage, I started understanding, you know, values a little bit more and color theory and that sort of thing. I started working into acrylic, but when I started with acrylics, it was like really transparent. Like I still wasn't. I didn't. I didn't have the balls yet to get into that opaque, like, direct painting. So I, I my first acrylics were just basically thin down acrylics. You know, I just build up. And then once I started getting that opaque, you know, started to understand like, you know, just how to build up your 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 values and understand that a painting is just literally, you know, the correct brushwork or brush stroke laid down to the to the, you know, another correct brush stroke, like putting together a puzzle basically. Um, then that's when, that's when painting became like almost an extension. You know, it just became like another like a language that I started to understand. And then uh, after years of that, I started messing with oils. Um, and then I really haven't been able to go back to acrylics. I've, I've done a couple acrylics since, and I'm like every single time I'm like, why am I using this medium? It's so frustrating and annoying. But oils is so much fun because it's so diverse. Um, you can do so much with it. And um, it, that's amazing. I, I didn't realize those were oils. So like when the paintings that you're talking about, like like the owls with the uh, – I love the just the, the detail on the feathers and the uh, – Yeah, that, that was done in gouache, yeah. That was – that's gouache? The snowy owl, yeah. Yeah. Wow, man. That's crazy. I got to go look, go look again at that. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, wow. So do you – like what's, what's your um, – with the gouache – like what kind of, what's your what's your approach with the technique? Like, are you doing those on illustration board? And do you have like um, do you do you start off kind of with like thin washes and then start to build up to opaque, or like what's because there's a, like you said gouaches, uh, gouache it can be a son of a bitch. Like, like I know what you're talking about. You if you um, you know you can put some a, a brush over. A, another stroke of color and all of a sudden that'll just come through and you're like, Oh no. And it's totally messed up. So, I mean, that's, that's interesting that you're doing those kind of paintings with gouache. That's awesome. That's well, I, I mean, I have to give credit where it comes from somehow because I'm self taught but somehow we always withdraw informations from someone else. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, for me, my hero was Carl Brenders. Hmm. Uh, Carl Brenders is a wildlife artist from Belgium. And uh, he's, 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 he's crazy good. Uh, anyway, so um, I saw a book one time and I got to see his technique. So uh, basically, I would work on a uh, museum board, not illustration board. It's too glossy. Okay. So it's, it's a museum board. It has a little bit of a tooth, not too much, very little. Okay. And it's acid-free. So what happened is I would do example if we focus, let's say, as if uh, we're talking about of a, a headshot of a wolf. Mm-hmm. So everything that is dark, example, almost like your Johnny Cash in the back. Everything that is dark, I, I would go sepia. Sepia? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, Tone. like an undertone. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sepia. Just to get the darker. Whatever is darker, I just do it right away with the brush. After that, I go with the same sepia tone, but with the airbrush, just to give the roundness and the shape, right? So mm. when it's done, it looks like a bit of a muddy, chalky kind of look and drawing. But I got the dark tones mm-hmm. and I got all the shade and the form. Then I start to build up the layers of the details with the gouache. Okay. Even even in my airbrush, when I would apply it with the uh, with the airbrush to get the form, I would put gouache literally in my airbrush as well. Oh, wow. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah. It yeah. didn't mess up the... No. The, oh. 
no, no, no. So no. I know air, that's another thing about airbrush that pissed me off all the time was how, when they clog, you're just like, oh, no. What, what were you using? What, what were you using? What, were you, what, what medium? Acrylic? Um, it was an acrylic yeah. base. Yeah. I mean, I, it was a long time ago. So to be honest, I don't remember. Yeah. It was, oh, gosh, dude. It was like 2003 or something. I started I out remember. with, uh, with uh, Dr. Martens. You know the ink, the mm -hmm. Dr. Martin, mm -hmm. and uh, and then I switched to I think it's FW acrylic ink. Yes, yes. That's how yeah. it, transparent. So transparent for me, I discovered that it was fantastic when I did the food illustration. For mm -hmm. some reason, I could get this transparency effect when I want to do like a tomato and all the glossy. I needed some transparency. It's a bit like glazing in oil language. Yeah, it? yeah. You know, <laughs> so I mean, yeah. That's pretty cool. So with the gouache, you do like the underpainting, and then once you have that underpainting set, you you just start going in opaquely um, yep. and just start building it up, building it up. Okay. Very 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 thin layers upon layers mm -hmm. upon layers. Yeah. And and even if I know a certain area, I don't know why it's a psychological thing. I don't know, or maybe I, I'm a bit afraid. Even if I know a certain part will almost be black, I could have just go and mix and go straight up black. I'm yeah. always building up. Same I, here, man. That's that's I, that's I what I do. I don't have the courage to say, okay, this is black. Let's do it now. I think it's – I do the same thing um, when I'm working traditionally that way. I think for me, black is so harsh and, you know – what scary. What, scary. What, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, like one thing that I've noticed just from observing nature and, and not just literally nature like animals but just reality – is that there's really not black in anything. Nope. Um, anything that you see that's black has actually got yeah. a lot of color and depth. Yeah. So when you put black on something, it just flattens it and it kills oh, it. Oh, so oh, you want to, you know, so like there, there's this artist that I really looked up to a lot uh, when I was first getting started. Um, I still like some of his work, um, but I met him in person and he was a real dick. So I kind of, uh, <laughs> kind of, uh, he's he kind of put a bad taste in my mouth. Um, but, uh, I saw one of his paintings and I was so excited to finally see one of his paintings in person. And when I saw it, I was like kind of um, taken back a little bit because his, his misuse of black made me realize that he wasn't really the kind of artist I thought he was. Like I realized his work had a certain uh, quality in print. And, and so maybe that's what he was doing. Like, so he, he was painting a certain way in oils um, so that, you know, and back then he was getting his work photographed, I'm sure for, um, editorial work and yeah, maybe it looks good in print, but when you see the original as an artist, I was like, Oh, geez. Like it, it, hap it happens often though. Yeah. And when, and when I saw the original, like it had this guy and he had his mouth open and, and it's, 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 it's supposed to be painted very realistic, but when you see the original in person, he, the inside of the mouth, he just painted black, just black. And it was so distracting and weird to me. And then the rest of the painting, wherever there was like shadows, it was just like creases in the clothing. It was just black, black. And um, and it was it, it was interesting for me because, you know, it, it kind of gave me a different perspective. Like, okay, you know, he's not all that. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's you not, know I don't know what he's doing, but it, that's not right. <laughs> you know what? Do you know where I learned how to make my black? From Bob Ross. <laughs> oh, really? That's funny. I, I've learned over the years. Before when I started, I used to be very one track. I want to be realistic. I would look only at the realistic artist in my style only. I wouldn't give a heck about the other guy. Yeah. Now, I sneak a bit in every kind of different style because yeah. it doesn't Amazing. matter if they do crap work. They may give you a tip that can change your career. Right, and right, right. I'm not a big fan of Bob's style, but I mean, he literally changed my way of doing my mixing my black, even yeah. though he's not the style that I like or I would do. But it's up to me to apply it in my own mm -hmm. style. But I could learn any tips from a cartoonist, a guy like you. It's a different uh, different world. I could learn different things. So I've learned yeah. that over the years that I can't just be one track looking. I could learn from a guy who does watercolor. It has nothing to do with, my, with oil painting. Right. Well, that's the best thing I think is, um, I think as artists, you, you know, to have an open mind that way, because I mean, the way that the best way I think of, that we learn, 
and I've said this many times before, but the best way that I think we learn is by struggle. You know, struggle helps us. Yeah, you know, we have to push through things and push through frustrations, and and that helps us learn how not to do things. And I think the more we learn how not to do things, the better we get. So, even even artists that are terrible, like for example, that piece I saw um, in person, I learned a lot from that because I realized how not to do it. Like I'm not going to use black that way. Um, you know what I mean? So. I think that's it's a really important thing, and like every little thing you can learn that way, you know, you fill up that toolbox as much as you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, that's it. Yeah. How um how big are those paintings that you're working on, the gouache paintings, uh, or the or the oils, both of them? Oh, yeah. Well, <clears throat> like, let's say like for instance, right now I just literally I'll send it out to you uh, a gorilla. Uh, it's a family of a silverback gorilla, and it's uh, 50 inch wide. Okay. By I think it's about 40. 36 40 something like that mm. and it, it's lit it lit it's literally it took me literally like three months even more it's, yeah. it's it's a it's a lot of work and also lately i've discovered that i prefer to do my own stretching i, I make my own stretch mm. my yeah. own my own wooden bar and i stretch my own uh, canvases i just like like it better you mm -hmm. know especially when it's that size and when you stretch a canvas there's so much pressure uh, you know, I just don't want things to crack up or whatever. I'm, I'm a little bit paranoid by this. You should see the, the way I frame it in the back. You'd think it's I'm building a bridge. I mean, <laughs> I, put, I put metal brackets in all the yeah. corners and then the T brackets for the reinforcement is it's overdone. But I just want to make sure it's. Yeah. <laughs> so so is it like so I, I actually prefer uh, painting on like stretch like canvas on like wood or something like that. I don't really like stretched canvases just because I'm, I, I like it to be like a real firm uh, surface. Oh, yeah. Um, when you st when you stretch your canvas is that tight. Is it pretty firm when you're painting on it or when I start a canvas? I was so scared because I used to work on board and it's solid. As a matter of mm -hmm. fact, before I work on canvas, I've done a few oil painting on MDF board just because of the sake of having a strong, solid panel. As a matter of fact, when I switched onto canvas, so let's say my canvas is uh, 18 by 24, I would take a three-quarter of an inch plywood, cut it out, put it from behind. It gives me a support. It doesn't bounce, mm. right? Oh, yeah. okay. But the pressure is so minimum when I paint for my style. Th there is zero bouncing. Maybe when you start, you do the blocking and the modeling. But after that, when you start detailed, nothing moves. Nothing moves. And mm. it's pretty, pretty tight. It's, it's quite tight, you know. So I don't have a problem with that at all. And obviously, I work with, uh, what you call that, a mallet. So mm, yeah. I, don't, I don't put my hand on it. There's no bouncing or nothing, you know. So When you're doing your oil uh, wildlife work, are you... Um, is it kind of a similar process where you, you first start off with an underpainting with like a like a burn a raw umber or something like that or sienna? Uh, I've done some like the gorilla I just finished. I went straight on the white canvas. I did the, I put two coats of gesso before, uh, depending the amount of tooth I want. If I want smoother, I put more gesso. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, but I I did it, uh, that one straight on the white canvas. Uh, the other gorilla that's on my website right now just just the big male with the little baby on the left there. Uh, that one, I actually did it on MDF board. That was before I started to work on canvas. And I did this raw umber background. Uh, the reason why I like to work on a, on a, on a background, colored tone background, <clears throat> is you know how it is when you work straight on white. The transition is so, is so strong mm -hmm. that sometimes it's hard to, you know, when you tone it down, it's just, first of all, it's easier for the eyes. You, it, it's like looking at, at, at snow in, in, in the sun almost, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I have a big lighting system. I have like a four rows of fluorescent by eight feet long. It's, mm. it's white. It's, it's very bright, right? So when you put a canvas underneath, it's like looking at snow sometimes. It's just like... Yeah. Well, I know what you mean. So when you tone it down, it kind of calms your eyes, first of all. And mm -hmm. I find it easier to calibrate the colors, you know, to match the colors. And and, and also, yeah. it, it does reflect, too. You know, it does reflect when you do your painting, you know. But it's not a must, but I, I don't know. It's I don't have any specific, to be honest with you, I don't have, I think I don't do twice the same thing. 
almost. Yeah, man. I'm the same exact way, man. That's so funny. I'm so you, not. You, you I, keep I, saying a lot of things, and I'm like, that's totally exactly how. <laughs> like, same thing with, like, I always tone things first. Um, I, I, I mean, not always. Obviously, there's been times where I start with white, but I like even that Johnny Cash. I have to finish that thing. I, I I've been. It's like something I want to do. It's just a, something for fun, you know, for myself. But I haven't gotten to finish it because I've been busy with other things. But you can see that is like I I did um I made my gesso like a like a medium tone gray, uh, and then I start building off of that just because like what you said like the white is just too much, um, and I want to be able to control my light. You know, is that what you mean? Like like basically we're, we're, you know if if it's if it's toned already, I decide where the white's going to be and when it's going to be. It's but um, I've seen people like probably with your gorilla painting, um, like a friend of mine, Robin Eli, he's just um, or Eli, sorry, he's an amazing oil painter, he's an Australian guy, and um, he'll do paintings with white canvas or white linen, and at the very end of the painting, all the white you're seeing is actually the the linen showing through, and that's so that's an interesting way of doing it as well. Like I just, just I've never really approached it that way personally you know yeah some people they would go with and, and put a whole a tone of cyanide all over let's mm -hmm. say on your portrait johnny cash all over and then they take a cloth and erase wherever the highlight is yeah yeah <laughs> you know there's and, so many ways yeah. yeah yeah but but you're painting behind with that is that what you would call a gr grise 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 you know the grise you know like you do like a it's like a gray you know those, those some of those artists they work. It's just like a gray tone, and then they apply full color on top. Gray oh, tone. I see what you're saying. No, this one actually, when it's done, I'm gonna it's gonna be black and white, but I'm actually gonna um, add some put some color in there to make it more uh, some things to pop out. But it's based off of black and white reference anyway, so I'm mostly doing like a like a value painting. Okay, yeah. Um, and um, my goal with this one, what I want to do with it is I want it to be kind of thick and painterly like some it's going to be a lot of just big sculpt like basically sculpting with brush strokes is what my plan is for this one um and uh, i'm not quite sure i was thinking of doing something of like like a crazy yellow or something behind him like just so it just pops with against the gray but um i'm not sure yet i'm hoping one of these days i have i always have something coming up and and then i can't work on it <laughs> so like there's always something happening so um, yeah, and unfortunately, I don't get to do as much traditional painting um, these days as, as I would like to. Um, but uh, that's something that uh, I show remedy. <laughs> I got to work. I got to try to make extra time. But I, I don't even know. Like, I'm, I'll be 50 in a couple uh, on, in December. And uh, I don't know. I don't know if I would even be able to do commercial art again. For one yeah. reason, for one reason, first of all, I mean, it would be ridiculous to show up there and say, "Hey, I still do it all traditionally," you know. You know There's what? People that do though. What would kill me is the what you call that the uh, revision, like mm -hmm. you know, there's little things yeah. you want to. Kills me when I do digital paintings. They still do it, and it sucks <sighs> when you do digital paintings. I would tell the guy. <laughs> I said, "Look, make sure because some of those art directors, they would go and say." Yeah, yeah, it's all good. It's all good. It's all great. Some of them had the experience to foresee ahead. They had a vision. Some of them, they would not until you do it. And then they would tell you if that's what they want or not. But anyways, uh, that would kill me and also the deadlines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this, the deadline for me is, is, is at the end, I was working mostly for private companies because I was into a lot of branding, packaging, food packaging. So I was not. Uh, working so much like your type of clientele. It was more like private food company. And when they would come up with a very tight deadline, I would tell them, look, here's the choice. I can meet your deadline. No problem. You will have garbage. I promise you. <laughs> or you give me a couple more days and then yeah. I'll do good work. But you know the sad, the, the sad thing is let's say you screw up or they want you to revise something, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you work like crazy night and day for whatever to meet the deadline. Suddenly, when there's a revision, oh, Jason, don't worry, we have time. Take, we have another two days. Why, <laughs> didn't she, why didn't you give it to me first of all? Like you know, they always have some extra time, right? But they don't yeah. tell you that they don't want to make ch take chance, right? But yeah. yeah, no, I totally relate, man. It's like it's 
like the kind of illustration stuff that you did, I would lose my mind. Um, I have no interest in. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of. Like, I, I, every once in a while, I have to illustrate. I have to like paint buildings and different things like that. Ugh, I hate that kind of stuff. Um, also, like advertisement things, like you know, painting a. You know, I mean, it it depends. I do some advertisement work still, but like, uh, you know, painting, creating uh, something that's like the like a cereal box or, or like a a pizza thing or whatever it is, like that kind of stuff. I I used to do that stuff a long time ago, and it drove me crazy. So the kind of illustration that I do now, a lot of portrait type stuff, or um, you know, some kind of a scene between like political figures or whatever it is, that's that's it's more uh entertaining at least it's more it's a lot more fun for me to do that kind of stuff but but still when you know most of my deadlines are usually two days to to paint a cover for a magazine or whatever it is and That's it's just crazy. crazy and then and then they come back to you and they're like oh you know like the one that kills me the most is after the sketch has been approved and um everyone's approved it and you start working they love it and then you you spend all this time doing this painting and it's super detailed and you just you killed yourself hand it in and they're like you know this this is perfect but now we're thinking maybe what if his eyes are looking this way and now his mouth is going like this like <laughs> that like can we you know we still have a few hours can you it's like what so that happens and it just drives me crazy like like even though um, so, so when I, when I do my illustration work, I only paint digitally because like you said, it, it makes it, like tra my traditional stuff is for private commissions, um, or for myself. The digital stuff is b mainly because of that. The deadlines are so crazy. It's, it can be overwhelming and stressful, but then they have these changes. And just because it's, it's a digital painting doesn't mean that it's, you're still drawing and painting. You're still like composing things you're still having to mix your color and, and you're it's 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 it's, it's, it's quicker but it's, it's still not painting by itself it's not yeah it's, <laughs> yeah and and you spend like all this time like rendering out a face and all this kind of stuff and all of a sudden it's like yeah 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 let's do a whole different face you're just like it's, it's still painting but that's the thing that's uh, that i've noticed that's happened in illustration is the more and more digital has become uh, more common for illustrators the more edit editors and art directors are like, oh, you just, you know, you just fix that real quick. And it's like, no, like that's not how I do. It. I mean, to be honest though, there are artists out there that I see do stuff, and I don't know what kind of trickery they're doing. There's there's some digital artists out there that it's it's a lot of tricks, a lot of little fun little tools that I don't even know how to do. Um, uh, for I'll give you a funny example though, I had to do. I did all these paintings uh, for an advertisement company where I had to paint all these like super hyper realistic uh, these women for this campaign, and they're all they're strong women in in their different fields. And this one woman in particular, she was she's kind of a bigger lady, and they wanted her to lose about thirty pounds in the painting, but I painted her how she actually looks. And they approved the sketch. They saw the block in everything. And when I handed in the final, they're like, "Yeah, she looks, you know, kind of big." And I'm like, well, "She looks exactly like the photo references, exactly." And, it's, and they're like, "We really need you to like make her face way thinner, make her smile a little bit more." I'm like, "Man, I wish you guys." Would. So, but then I had a, a buddy, an illustrator friend of mine, who goes, "Oh, dude, there's like this thing in Photoshop that." I think I think it's called liquify. And he goes, if you just select the face, it recognizes the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and you can actually just take in the side of the face and you can you can do all these different things and it takes 2 seconds. And I was make like, what? Smile, make her smile. All, like, <laughs> I'm like, I never even knew this thing existed and it kind of pisses me off to be honest. Um, cuz I can tell now that people use that a lot, but so I just tried it because I, I had no time to like repaint her. And it, dude, it was crazy. Like I was able to take in the sides of her cheeks. Um, and, and then there's the mouth that, that you can like select the mouth and you can, you can kind of make it smile. It looks pretty natural. So I made these changes. And then what I did is I went on top and I painted on top to, to make it all like really work, you know, and make sure that it looked flawless, but it saved me like just hours. Like I never, but I, I don't like that kind of stuff. Like I, I would prefer, you know, I always tell people 
you know, for me, I, I choose to not abuse the computer. I want to, I still, if I'm painting digitally, I still want it to be art, right? I want to be, you know, the, the hand behind it. Um, but sometimes in illustration, you got to get to do what you got to do, you know, to get that deadline finished. But yeah, but, but, but I think, you know, in the world of commercial art, I know what you mean as an artist's point of view, but I think for the, uh, you know, for, for for the style of, of 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 the demand and everything, I think I think digital makes sense in commercial art. The deadlines are too crazy. Yeah, and, they are. And they don't see us as artists. It's weird. Like mm -hmm. I mean, tomorrow morning, if you decide to quit all your commercial your your commercial art, whatever, and you just go full fine art, they're gonna value you as an artist yeah. because because you're an illustrator. It's like. Look at Norman Rockwell. He's he's my he's my hero. In yeah, uh, mine too. I, I love Norman Rockwell. Yeah, he like I mean the guy was not even seen as an art as a fine artist. He was just an illustrator. Yeah. And now and now suddenly today we look at him almost as a painter, but he was not. You know. So when you're into the com the, the commercial art, they have this 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 this. It's like we're we're not categorized in, 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 the, in the right box. It's like they they will not see me as a, as an artist. Oh, you're just an illustrator. You're just representing a, a a package, an item, or something. Yeah, but I know. I mean, but it's like you know, it's like you said. You know, it takes time, and I don't know. I, I had to struggle with this. So I had to work on Red Bull one time, like for I'm not kidding, three nights and three days. I was drinking Red Bull. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. I had my studio here down uh, upstairs at the time, and it was in winter. In order for me to not fall asleep while working, I would open the window, and it was in winter, but it was cold. So I would put a little coat and a toque <laughs> to yeah. keep me awake. And I was. Oh, I love that you said toque. That's so awesome. <laughs> I put on a toque, eh? You know <laughs> what I mean, eh? <laughs> Canadian. I had some brewskis, and I had a toque. <laughs> you know, no? that's great. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, and I remember one day I was just sitting there trying to send an email to a guy and I never finished typing the address. I fell asleep on the keyboard. My head tall finished <laughs> because the, the thing is I was working for brand company. So I was doing a lot of packaging for extra hard cider and all those stuff. So they would come like with 12 different flavors and I had oh to do all, all the packaging, you know. All the oh. labels, so it's like it's all in one shot, you know. And you cannot use two, three different artists or illustrator. It has to be all the same. Yeah, yep. Steady, right? That's crazy. The um, the there there's illustrators today that I've had a few in my podcast that still work traditionally, and I I'm like that is crazy, man. Because like they're working for some of the same clients I work for, um, and it's just I don't know, man. To me, it's like make it as less stressful as possible um my, my ultimate goal is to to do high quality illustration work you know um sometimes it's not possible you know because the deadlines are so crazy and it's like um you know what can i like i kind of have depending on the client right like depending on because sometimes i get asked to do like super realistic type portrait type work and then sometimes i get to do my caricature work which is still painted realistically so there's different variations that I have for clients. So like, hey, if you give me a day or two, um, I'm going to give you a high quality final image, which means it's going to look just like the people. It's going to serve the purpose. It's going to tell the story. But maybe it's going to be more painterly, more suggestive. So it's not going to be, um, you know, and also, let's face it, if it's like an illustration for a magazine or something like that, it's going to, it's only going to be like what, like, eight and a half inches by 11 or whatever the print size, you, you're not going to be zooming in. So, I mean, as long as it looks good at that size, just whatever, um, you know, but other clients, you really want to get that, that detail and put that in because it, you know, it, it can open other doors for bigger jobs and better jobs and stuff. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a but, balancing act, you know, but, but I think there's, it's not every illustrator like yourself who has, uh, both sides of the metal like you can do commercial art and you can also do fine art if you want mm -hmm. like you know like do your portrait but in a fine art style yeah. right so there's a i i used to uh, deal with illustrators 
who were only illustrator. They had no concept of what fine art rendition was like. They're just mm -hmm. straight commercial artists. Yeah. You know what I mean? So oh, it's, yeah. almost, it's almost like in, on, on your side, you have the luxury to just do the commercial art real quick, digitally. That's what you want. Boom, boom. And then really take your time to do your fine art piece or spend more time aside as a second market type of thing. Yeah. But there's, there's a lot of illustrator who are only illustrator. And if the advertising agency doesn't call them, they're finished. There's no plan mm -hmm. B. It's just yeah. illustrations. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so you, it's a bonus you have on your side. And I, 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 you know, it's not every, there's an artist I knew he was using airbrush only. Some of them are very, like, they're crazy good with airbrush only. But, you know, if you use airbrush only, uh, how can I say that? You have zero flexibility or zero experience to work with brush. It's a whole different world by itself. Oh, so yeah. I know an, an illustrator back then in Montreal who was very good, and he was superstar back then as the airbrush artist. He wouldn't be able to do any brush work. So let's say he would do an illustration that requires a lot of airbrush. So let's say, example, your portrait. I'm always picking on that because it's right there. But let's say, <laughs> let's say your Johnny Cash would be all airbrush, and let's say for some reason the hair would have to be brush work. He would send, he would do the whole face airbrush, and he would send the drawing to another artist so he can do just the hair with brush work. He would not be able to use brush at all. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This, you know, there's some artists like that who don't have the luxury or the skill or whatever to, you know. So, I think count yourself lucky. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> both of them. You know. And and by the way, I only I need one more reason I need to finish that soon is because I the only reason I have it there is to cover up the yeah, yeah. like my wife's an artist as well and she has like her art table stuff back there so um, I need to get like some kind of background drop or something but. <laughs> It's just there for now to kind of block up the background. But okay, so I had another question uh, about your your fine art, your uh, wildlife work. I have a few questions about that, if you don't mind. But um, it's for, since we're talking about deadlines and that sort of a thing, how how does it work? Uh, like, is that is is a lot of it like private commission, or is it you coming up with a painting and then selling it to a, a collector or a gallery? Um, and do you have like a certain amount of time that that you have to get these done, or is it kind of like, hey, I'm you know like this lot the gorillas took like you said three months. Yeah. Um, do you have to go at a certain pace with them, or can you kind of just you know your own pace with it, like whatever feels comfortable? I've been very lucky and 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 blessed, so to speak, uh, with the timing because I made it clear on the contract the piece will be finished when it's finished, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, example, the gorilla, I think it's been here for almost six months now. And I just finished it because I did other work in between. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what happened is sometime on my spare time, I would do, because all of my concept before I actually paint it on the canvas, I do what you call a, um, a digital concept. So I put all my, you know, my items in that case, example, the gorillas and I want the tree there and I want the grass in the front. I put it all digitally. I have a better control, right? So sometime in my spare time, I would just create on my own for fun uh, a concept of a big horn sheep or whatever the animal, the bird is, and I would store mm. it. So let's say the client would call and say, Dennis, I love your work. I would like to own a piece, an original. Do you have something in mind? No. Okay. Then I would just email them all the concepts that I've done for fun that I stored. And I say, is there any one that you happen to like that I have here? And sometimes mm. they say, it's all beautiful, but I'm not a big fan of this and this and this. I want a, I want an owl. Okay. I will customize um, a digital concept for you. I always do a digital concept because it doesn't matter if the art, if the client likes my work, he may not like my concept. Mm. So, I don't want him. You don't want to waste time. I don't want him to have a surprise and say, "Oh, wow, your brushstroke is great, your painting is." But, but I, I did not want the owl in that concept. I wanted to 
perch be perched on a fence on a post or something like i mean you know so this way it's clear okay this is what you have this one i'm going to do and uh and i think i send you uh what i've done there you know the photo digital versus the painting i go pretty close but yet i, I allow myself to change things to make it even look better right so since 2008 just when the crash happened back then when i made my transition from commercial art to fine art uh, i always had pre-sold commissions mm. it never stopped you know so um you know that's how i work you know so it's it's uh, i guess because it takes me so long to do a painting it's not i don't need a whole lot of volume you know what i'm saying yeah if yeah. i would work faster i would probably in, <laughs> sit, sitting waiting many times but you know but anyways it's 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 like that so they're all they're all a pre-sold commission so far you know and and i i make an agreement i say look this is the time it's going to take and i don't really know but and my, my clients have been very very patient so far you know that's great that's that's yeah. so um that's so nice as an i i did a couple years ago i did a bunch of uh oil commissions and it was pretty stressful because um, I, you know, every painting is different and some paintings, you know, take a little longer or, you know, and they were, they were kind of impatient. Like we want it now. And to, even to the point of, I'm like, well, I, it has to dry so I can varnish it. And they're like, no, we want it like yesterday. And it's, you know, so it's like, there was that pressure and it's, it's like, for me, when I'm working in oils, like I really, um, I'm, I, I'm not a fast. I can paint fast if I if I need to, but I prefer to kind of just take my time and and you know, it's some a, days you just feel like it's a it's a treat. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> and and you know and I and I work, I work so so fast with deadlines uh, with you know my editorial work that when I get to work with oils, I just I want to really enjoy it and um and and some days like you just you feel like you know, it's a slower day, you know, or, you know, some days you're just rocking. So it's, it's not like, like, I think they, sometimes I think that we're just like robots or something. <laughs> you can just pump that. Out. Do you, um, so for your wildlife work, um, it's, you have so much, I mean, like I'm thinking right now that elephant piece is really cool. Um, but w what do you do for reference? Um, I mean, because obviously you, you're not, you can't like go hang out with elephants. But I mean, what do you do for reference for something like that? Um, uh, for something so detailed, you know? Well, as you know, it's all based, you know, on photographs. But I could take the head from one and pluck it there, make sure the proportions mm -hmm. are right. The light source comes from the same, uh, the same side and everything. Uh, adjust it the best I can digitally, but sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> I, I'm not as qualified as you uh, to work with digital. I would say I'm not even qualified. I'm just a Photoshop kind of a guy who does put the photo together. So yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to do what you do digitally. So I do the best I can. So there's a lot of adjustment when I actually do the final painting. But uh, it's all basically reference taken from everywhere. Like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, And you're uh, just kind of keeping the concept in your head. Like, hey, I, I know I want like a warm lighting coming from this side. So you're, you're just thinking about that as you're piecing things together. I, I am not. It's weird. And you're probably going to relate with that. Sometimes I have a very strict idea of what I want. This is what I want. By the time I'm finished, it's not, it's not that at all. Mm, yeah. you, you know, it's, it's, it's like, so basically when I do the digital concept, I allow myself, you know, like example, when you paint, when you paint traditionally, you be attentive to the brush stroke. Sometimes it's like, hey, this is not quite the brush stroke I wanted to put, but that's actually cool. I'm not touching yeah, yeah. I'm not touching it anymore. Yeah. You you're being sensitive to 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 what's happening, right? So yeah, when I do the, the moment. Yeah. So when I do the digital concept is is the same. Sometimes I have an idea in my mind, but I'm thinking, okay, let how about if I let the element of surprise kind of let it happen naturally by itself and sometimes it's like wow I, I never thought about it you know so i kind of let it flow you know uh, somehow you know so i always make sure my problem is not the background per se it's the animal or the bird or the subject this is what i start first so if i want to have a big horn sheep uh, i want to create a big horn sheep concept i'm going to look for the sheep first 
ah, oh, that's a great reference. And I mean, it's a great photo. It's, 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 it's detail, whatever. So now how, what is the position of the sheep? Is she standing like she could be on a cliff or, and then I kind of put the landscaping according to posture of the animal, you know, and I work my way around it, you know. Do you ever have to contact uh, and find like the photographers? Uh, I, I have a photographer. Uh, actually, there's a painting I, I should be doing, but I have too much commission. Uh, he's given me a few photographs that he said, Dennis, this is yours. And he said, you do whatever you want with it. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. So what happened is it's uh, it's uh, what you call that uh, a, le uh, a leopard in a tree, you know, the very common thing. So I'm going to change the background a bit. I'm going to keep the leopard and stuff like that, you know. So sometimes I had to buy the, uh, what you call that, uh, some photo stock image and get mm. the usage rights. Yeah. But, but even that, I take the head, I take the body, and it just yeah. I play around until I don't even know myself. Where is the original resource, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's all so different. Like, it's all been changed so much, you know. But, uh, yeah. That's no, that it. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I do basically the same kind of thing for like, like and I mean, and yeah, you have to do. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I do that, you know, finding references for different places and piecing things together. But then also I take a lot of pictures of myself <laughs> or, or of my wife or different, whoever I can get to get like the kind of lighting folds and clothing or whatever I need, you know, because I, I paint a lot of people. So I have to do a lot of like clothing and paint a lot of hands and stuff like that. So. Um, whatever you got to do to get it done. Um, Rockwell, I mean, he, he was like, he, he was one of my favorite artists as well. Um, did, have you read his book? I, I've, I've read his book. I've seen all yeah. his YouTube documentaries. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, like I love you. you, you I, I say this all the time. So people have heard me say this, but I love that there's like one of the chapters he's talking about reference and how he nailed a duck down to a piece of wood. So like it wouldn't move while he was painting. Like he, he nailed it through its uh, feet to a board, so it's just sitting there, so he could paint. <laughs> it's just... Actually, when we would have, let's say, like a, a person walking on the street, yeah, you know, with his feet, like as if he's walking. Well, yeah. he would actually put books under his on the front of the shoe and some in the back. So when the model would actually lean his feet, yeah, 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 have a stack a book to give the illusion that he's walking. Yeah. No, it's, it's so great. It's so good. I love that, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, by the way, you know what time it is? It's time for Serious Questions with Jason Seiler. <laughs> and uh, I heard through the grapevine uh, that, similar to me, you you like to sing in the shower. And if, if you if you were to come by... Uh, uh, in not a per perverted way, but come by in my shower, you might hear something like, Don't go chasing waterfalls. Please stick to the rivers and the lakes that you used to. Oh, uh, mm, yeah. Uh. You might hear some of that. You might hear some some Kanye West or uh, Johnny Cash. I don't know. Like you'll, There's a lot of weird things. Or, or maybe just like making up songs and stuff. But I heard that that you dabble a little bit in opera, and I was wondering um, if you could give us a little taste of that, um, and also just maybe a little little backstory on that because that's interesting as well. <laughs> I find, anyways. Okay, well, <clears throat> you know, I started in the shower. But really, you know, it, 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 it ended up being serious. I ended up being part of the Canadian Artists Association here in Vancouver. And I started to sing in a lot of uh, in all the big major theaters. And I sang the national anthem for our BC Lions here and stuff like that. And I'm known what you call a dramatic tenor. Mm. So dramatic tenor stands between the baritone, tessitura, and the high tenor. So I'm not like... Andra Bocelli, who has a really high, but I'm not the baritone, so has a very deep, manly, people would call that, a tone <laughs> of voice, you know? So that was uh, in 1998. 1998, I was with a friend of mine, and he goes, like he said, uh, let's just watch TV. So I'm watching TV, and then suddenly I see this tall guy in a white suit, which is Andrea Bocelli. 
So he was actually singing Time to Say Goodbye with Sarah Brightman. And at home, we were not musically, music, uh, musically oriented. So it's like, wow, this guy is awesome. I had no idea I had interest in opera or I would do opera singing later on in my life. I, I just enjoy the guy's talent. I went to buy my first album of his, and it was uh, called Romanza. 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 <laughs> I brought it in my, in, my, in my bachelor at the time, and I started to scream my heart out. So... Uh, so basically, I'm going to pull out a couple notes, no warming up, nothing. But basically, when you sing opera, it's your body becomes literally an air pump machine. Mm. So it, it all comes from the diaphragm. If I know, now I won't go with a very high note because I haven't prepared, but I'm going to still push a good one. But um, when you know you're going to, if when I know I'm going to reach a high note, I basically have meant to mentally, I have to prepare myself right from the start of the song that I'm preparing for that very high note later. So I don't get caught on the last minute. Ah, that's on interesting. The, on the red light, so to speak. Oh, I wasn't mentally prepared. Otherwise, you can't push it. So you have to kind of, uh, uh, what you call that, uh, control your body to prepare it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So <clears throat> it goes like this. This is a very, I'm going to sing a couple lines. It's... Uh, it's uh, it's called Iluchevan Lestelli. It's a very dramatic thing, and that's uh, actually saying it on one of my uh, YouTube there. So if I push a note, it goes like this. Oh, Definitely not what happens in my shower. <laughs> Unprepared. <laughs> Although I do feel like I'm in love with you now. Uh, <laughs> that was awesome. Holy crap. That's crazy. So you were just, you're just like, just did kind of just sang, you know, and, and then how did, but how did you go from doing that in the shower to all of a sudden now, like, like how did, did you like tell someone, Hey, by the way, I sing in the shower. You should hear it sometime. Like uh, how did, like, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a guy, I think, who dares a lot. I, okay. I, I, I'm very bold. Like, I, I'm, I could meet the Pope tomorrow, so to speak, you know? I, I, I'm not... <laughs> I like, like that. I'm not saying I'm, I'm arrogant, but it's like I, I'm not afraid to, to step in, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, so uh, one day I thought, wow, I mean, first of all, <laughs> to back up a little bit, I was singing one time in a garden wedding, O Solo Mio. And I said to the guy after the wedding was over, I said, give me the mic. I just want to sing for fun. And it was a mess. But, I mean, talk about charisma and not a shame of myself, but it was a disaster. And my wife goes like, Dennis, stop it. We can hear you down the street. But it was terrible, right? But it's to say I, I believe in myself. And I thought one day uh, I'll pull it off, right? Yeah. So anyway, so I went to a recording studio one day and I said, I would like to record my studio and see how it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so uh, we basically uh, record the first song, O Solo Mio, and other songs. And it's like, wow. So finally, with those YouTube recordings, that was actually useful for me to knock at other people, uh, at other doors, and say, look, this is, this is my kind of a style, whatever. And then I started to sing here locally. It's called The Singing Christmas Tree. And it's in a big church. And uh, what happened is at Christmas time, it's a big tree. There's like 75 to 80 people in the tree, like two, three stories high, whatever. And there's performances going on in the front of the tree. So I was offered to perform there. I have never performed for big crowds ever before. And I sang for uh, five performances for two weekends in a row hmm. for a total of 20,000 people. Wow. I'm, I'm in the back waiting for my number to come and I see the two doors are closed but it's a little bit of a crack and I'm looking and I'm starting to see all the church being 
being packed and people are coming. I'm like, oh, holy smoke, I'm going to face all those people soon. It's like my heart goes like, <laughs> you know. So my, tr my trick for me is to uh, literally uh, go one step at a time. I used to do martial arts. I did the, the cage fighting, G the uh, jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Oh, so, cool. Yeah, so we were, we were taught to control our mind, right? So uh, I, I, I was going like one step at a time. I said, okay, why should I be nervous now? I'm, I, I'm not there yet. I, I'm in the back. So finally, when my turn comes, I'm walking to the stage. Why should I be nervous? I haven't seen yet. I'm behind the mic. Why should I be nervous? I haven't started yet. You know, like I literally, when you say yeah. one step at a time, and then eventually I got used to face big crowd. And then obviously we made videos of, of a few performances and it just went on like that, you know? Mm. And then I don't, I cannot read music. I don't have two minutes of uh, vocal training, mm -hmm. uh, you know? So it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a passion of mine. Uh, a lot of people, my wife can testify that, Hundreds of people thought I was Italian when they look at me. <laughs> I'm telling you, I go to an Italian restaurant, they speak to me in Italian. Yeah. It's, 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 I don't know what, my, my uh, family descent is German, German. Mm. Meyer is from Germany. So, uh, but it's funny, you know, so I got to sing here locally. It's called every summer. Now they don't do it because of the COVID, but. It would be called uh, the Italian cultural. Uh, no, no, not this. Uh, what's that called? Italian festival. So they mm. would block. They would block several streets on the very busy street, and I would sing there in Italian in front of a bunch of Italian people. Now, oh. do you even know the words, like what they mean, or do you just memorize how, how to what? Like how do well, you? <laughs> well, first of all, French and Italian is very close. Yeah, it's close. Latin based. Yeah, yeah, it's close, and it's uh, it's just when you pronounce the R, like I like you know, like a like example, an English people would say ro romanza, but if you say romanza, you see the difference just because of the R being pronounced more. That makes a difference when you sing. If you pronounce the R. That yeah. makes it, uh, you know. But uh, obviously, I know, I know what it means. I went online and <laughs> look at the tra yeah. translation. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome! Wow, that's yeah. really cool. And um, that was serious questions with Jason Seiler. Uh, that was awesome, man. Um, <laughs> that was really cool. thanks for doing that. That was really cool. Um, so, as you know, part of what I do on my podcast is uh, I, I ask uh, fans to do fan art. Um, and so we got a few submissions. So, uh, and uh, they're from people from all over the world. And sometimes they're caricatures, sometimes they're uh, portraits. And so we'll see. Um, so let me switch screens here. Let me know if you see this. Are you seeing that? No, don't see anything. Oh, oh. <laughs> see oh that's, that's <laughs> very slick. <laughs> wow. This is uh, from, this is uh, Ramanjit Ko. Car, car. Oh, I'm not a... sure if I'm saying that right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> he's got the hairdo going on there. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. I like the fact that he actually moved the brush. When I took that picture, I didn't like by accident. The brush was literally hitting my lips. Uh, and he actually backed it up, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, this one. Uh, the, the this is from Jacques Lamonnier. Um and uh, he he wrote me. I was like, "What's going on here?" But he said that all the paintbrushes it reminded him of Freddy Cougar. So he did like a sort of a mix <laughs> between you and Freddy Cougar. <laughs> it's a pretty nice drawing though. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, the drawing itself, yeah, it's, it's pretty nice, nice values. Yeah, really nice pencil work. It's yeah, awesome. Yeah. yeah. And uh, here's a. <laughs> This is, um, let's see. Oh, this is by Juan Gastelum. Uh, what, what's going on? He always has lots of fun things going on. Let's see what's to say. Fuya and hats off, respect. Let's see. Precision <laughs> with your toes. Precision. <laughs> I almost look like Mulroney or something. <laughs> <laughs> kind of uh, look Elvis-ish. 
Yeah, yeah, I that's right. It. With the hair, yeah, yeah. That's funny. That's hilarious. I've um, never. Oh wow, that one is cool. Yeah, this one's by is Patrick that... um, Lamgruber. That one looks digital. Yep. Yeah, this is a digital one. Yeah. I have ne- I never had my face being uh, done in caricature like this. <laughs> this is crazy. I look like a. I look like a thief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kind of look like a. Um, a robber. <laughs> yeah, like from the nineteen twenties or something. <laughs> like, listen here, see, it's only going to hurt for a few minutes. See, <laughs> come quietly. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, oh, cool. <laughs> this one, this one cracks me up. This is by Dominic Zeilinger. <laughs> he he had a, he had some fun pushing the, the form in this one. <laughs> oh, my nose is in serious lockdown. Yeah, it, you know what? It's it's interesting the way that how he's got it, your nose going into your lips that way. The, it, the, it I don't even know if this makes sense, but it reminds me of the front of a Corvette. Or something like the the way the 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 front comes over the tires, you know. Me, I saw me, I saw more like a wild boar. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> I guess it's, part of the lip. I guess it's up. my wildlife part of myself. Yeah, oh, that's cool. That's hilarious. Oh, that's the last one. Um, here, let's go back. Am I back? Yeah, I'm here. All right, cool. Uh, thanks everybody for submitting drawings. That's always so much fun. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's really cool. So, man, um, whoops, hold on a second. Something can, there's a weird thing on my screen, but maybe no one else can see that. Um, but yeah, so awesome to to talk with you and get to meet you um, and talk about your your process and you know just it's it's interesting because even though you do a completely different like genre, I guess of art. I, one of the things I love about talking with artists is that we all, for the most part, most artists that I that I have on, um, all kind of relate and can understand, you know, in a way where we're coming from. But it, it's really cool to hear from different people's point of view and different perspectives. And it's interesting. I have the same kind of mentality as you um, when it comes to, you know, like like even like music, for example, um, when I was uh 18 and i finally decided to start playing guitar a week later i had my first show like it it was like that fast like i just jumped into all of a sudden i'm in a band and then i toured for years playing in bands and um you know recently i decided i wanted to do stand-up and all all of a sudden i start doing stand-up comedy and so like it's one of those things i think that it is tough it's really hard it doesn't always go well but um talk about talk (laughs) about self-confidence this is like but I think the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think as artists, I think, I mean, it's there. It does take a, it, it does take a self confidence to do these things. But also, I think that, you know, we start to kind of develop like a, a, you know, we have a drive and a passion to create and to try things. Like, why not try things? Like, like I also will try any kind of food from any kind of culture. Um, I will listen to any kind of music I can. Um, I will, you know, try. I will go to plays or operas or what anything that I can that is different or new or you know, just to try take a taste of everything as an artist. Like I want to create, I want to learn, I want to grow. And you know, like for me with the comedy thing, I like to write and I like to make people laugh. So I would kill myself if I didn't try that, you know. And I think that's 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 very that's really cool. I think that's awesome that you did that with with the opera as well because it's like I mean obviously you're really really good at it. But um, a lot of people would be like, eh, I'll just stick to the shower, you know. Um, but I think that's part of what makes us artists, you know, uh, taking that step and push. Like I mean, I'm sure even with your paintings, there's probably when you were first learning. I mean, this is how it was for me, anyways. Um, when I first started to paint. I couldn't obviously paint well right away, but I knew that I could, you know, and I'm not going to give up. I'm going to, I'm going to do this and I'm going to be the best that that I can at it. Um, and some people just don't seem to have that, 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 um, I I don't know if you can relate with this. I always have like like my inner voice in my head 
even to this day, when I'm painting, there's usually a point in my painting where I'm like, I could, there's like this voice in my head that says, ah, this sucks. Or, man, this is terrible. Um, it's not as good as it could be. It's not as good as it should be. You're better than this. Uh, you should scrap it, start over, throw it away. There's always something. And I have to push past that. I have to push through that and ignore it. And I, I'm at the point now I know it's going to happen. So just ignore it, push through, keep pushing through. And it's, it's interesting. Um, uh, are you schizophrenic as well? <laughs> <laughs> is no. what I'm trying to say. No. <laughs> like, but do you, do you hear that voice? Is you know what I mean? Like that. There's like that. Ah, oh, this is this is terrible. Or, you know, this this isn't even going to work. And so I I deal with that all the time while I'm working. Um, but I think a lot of people when they're first interested in art, they just listen to that voice in in their head, and they you know they don't they don't take that chance. So I, I think it's more than confidence. I think it's you know a belief in yourself, and also a fight to push past. Th those kind of feelings in, um, that we have, anyways. No, I, I, I mean, I mean, you're right because I think the worst enemy is ourself, right? And uh, sometime I, I, I told that one time to my dad because he's, he's, he's my biggest fan, you know. And I said, you know, that I said, just as much as it looks like we like to be, uh, for the lack of better words, glorified or praised for our work, mm -hmm. I said that little moment. Is very short. That happens if we have a, what you call that a show and we display our work. People come and mm -hmm. comment and, and beautiful work and wonderful. But look at all the amount of other hundreds and thousands of hours we work in our studio. We constantly self-criticizing ourselves all the time. Yeah. And back to what you were saying. For me, when I do a painting, I always try to think. I want to do a painting that when I'm done. It doesn't look like Dennis. I want to feel like I'm looking at someone painting. It's like, wow. I I'm trying to get out of myself, to deliver yeah. myself. L l like, you know, I, I don't want the Dennis style, so to speak. I want one you I want to be surprised when I look at it as if someone else looked at it. It's an it's like it's like running after my own shadow. It's impossible, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm at it this whole time. I cannot be a surprise. So that's why I work with a mirror, you know? So mm. sometimes I look at my painting in the back of a mirror and I kind of look at it in a different, as if someone else looks at it, you know, just to kind mm. of, but it's, I don't think any artist is happy with their work once it's finished. Every painting, <laughs> every painting that I'm done, like right now I finished the gorilla. It's all varnish. It's on the side for me. It's like my best piece. The first brush stroke I'm going to put on my next coming up. This one is already out. This is going to be the real one. Yeah. Just yeah, I feel off. the same way. It's it's a it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, and you know what sucks is like when you when you uh, this happens to me where I work really really crazy hard on the deadline, and even though it's it's a short deadline and you know I know I could do better if I had more time, I feel very proud of okay this one's this is going to be a good one, and I'm done I'm finished, and it's published, it's out there now. Nothing I can do. You can't do anything now to change things. And then I notice things like, oh, there's a, ch like a tangent there. Or like, you know, this would have been better if it was just moved over slightly this way. Or, man, I should have made that color pop in that one. It's like, but it's done. And it, you just have to be like, Psh, it's gone. Most, it's of like, the time, most of the time, those issues, another professional artist may not even see what you see. Yeah, that's between you and yourself most of the time because it's not like you're an amateur; you're pro already. So those little problems is it's it's a perfectionist issue that yeah. another professional artist may not even see it. Yeah, you it know? still drives me crazy though. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, 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 <laughs> but yeah. again, that's another uh, another thing. Like back to what I was saying before about learning how not to do things. You know, when those kind of things happen, I just kind of remember. Like, remember last time? Try not to let that happen again. You know, so I just yeah. kind of keep that in my mind. So, um, but uh, I got to wrap this baby up. But um, I just want to say, hey, thanks again for uh, for reaching out to me uh, and showing me your work. Um, I really enjoy it. And uh, it's been great getting to know you a bit and talking with you. You're a um, fun guy, man. And awesome, awesome work. Uh, before we split, um, is there anything that you would like to add or share or promote with anybody so that people can follow you and that sort of a thing? Uh, well, first, I want to thank you for allowing me to be on your podcast. Uh, uh, only my wife can tell you I'm not lying. Uh, <clears throat> I'm listening to your 
I think I pretty much listen to almost half of all your podcasts right now. Oh. I'm, I'm, I'm putting them all day long. It's, it's, it's <laughs> very cool. I used, to list, I used to listen to another kind of podcast, which I won't name, but now I'm, I'm kind of hooked on yours. Uh, <laughs> well, I appreciate sorry, that. Man. Sorry about the noise. I think they're cutting the street here. No, it's okay. But anyways, uh, yeah, so thanks for having me here. And uh, what I want to say is I think I think what makes a good artist is is discipline. I've seen a lot of people. I had some, I've never been a great teacher, but I had a one-on-one -on -one te uh, student for three years. I told him, I said, look, who you are right now, not in six months, not in two weeks, right now, who you are. Put double the amount of time in your work, you will go from here to there instantly. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, just because you put more time, you know. Yeah. So uh, I say sometimes to my client, I said, look, I said, you like my work? You ask me to do the same thing, half the amount of time, you will have garbage. <laughs> I'm not, I like I'm, that. I'm not magician, right? I mean, yeah. it, it's time involved, right? So mm -hmm. anyway, it's, 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 for me, my key is, is discipline and taking my time. For, for for my kind of market anyways so uh yeah so i think that's what it is 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 it's not happening by itself I'll, I'll say like norman rockwell would say i wish i could just paint yeah Norm, normal would say i wish i could just paint in other words hold your pipe and <laughs> look at it it's magic can, <laughs> can we just be relaxed but we're so like Ugh. as a matter of fact sometime when i want to relax i may look at youtube's on abstract artists what totally opposite style than me for me, it's like, oh, I still want to look someone painting, but not be so intense. So for me, <laughs> when I look at someone painting, totally different style. It's a therapy. I'm relaxing. And, uh, you know, so I think discipline is, is the key or whatever the style. Yeah. And I think you're, you're the number one to understand that because being a commercial artist, if you're not disciplined, uh, I mean, what else are you supposed to do, right? You have, yeah. dead, you have deadlines, you have quality, you have... You have all that combined in, in two days. That's that's uh, quite the combo to deliver, you know. Yeah, it gets old sometimes, but but I still love it though. I still yeah, love yeah. it, you know. So thank you so much, man. That was awesome, and yeah. uh, thank you everybody uh, for tuning in. Um, and uh, we'll see you next week with Kevin Nealon. Until then, um, have a good life. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> see ya. Yeah, bye bye. You want answers? truth.